Hello and welcome to London Rising. I'm Will McPherson, the Evening Standards Cricket Correspondent, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Ebony Rainford-Brent. She's now an award-winning, uh, congrats on the BAFTA, by the way, commentator, broadcaster and pundit for Sky, the BBC and others, a businesswoman and administrator as director of women's cricket at Surrey. But Ebony first fell in love with the game at the age of 10 when she, she hit her first cricket ball at Stockwell Park School on a Saturday morning. She'd go on to become captain of the Surrey women's cricket team and the first black woman to play for England and part of the team that won the World Cup and World T20 in 2009. In early 2020, she pioneered the ACE programme, which is the African Caribbean Engagement Programme, in response to a 75% decline of the black British professional players. Uh, and in October, the ACE programme was first launched as a charity. Last year, Ebony also joined other high profile uh, minority black background players in discussing her personal experiences of racism in sport. The game's been sh shaken up, the spotlight has been shone, and the stories have been heard, she said, and what's clear is there's no going back. Ebony Rainford Brent, thank you for joining me at the Evening Standards London Rising event. First of all, I have to start by asking you about London. You are one of the proudest Londoners I know. I can see <laughs> there's a sign behind you saying, uh, with Brixton on it, we're Tell me a little bit about your relationship with the city. And you, you know, you grow up, grew up here in South London. You you went to uni here. You play cricket here. You still live here. Tell me about you, yourself in London. Yeah, I haven't gone very far, Will. I've tried. I have to be honest. Like I, do you know what I love? I've travelled around the world as we've both been fortunate enough through sport. And um, I genuinely don't think there's a greater city other than the weather, which does get us sometimes. The actual everything, the melting pot of people, the fast-paced nature. Even a sweaty tube, I don't mind. Um, I love London that much. Um, and then I would say in terms of relationship with London, like when I, when it was considered to go to uni, I remember having interviews up at Oxford, down in Nottingham. I went around for my interviews and I thought, do you know what? There's nowhere I actually want to be other than London. And then I actually left London for two years to live in Cambridgeshire and I just up sticks and came straight back. I missed it. So this is home. I think it would be hard for me to leave. So uh, I love it so much. We're here to talk uh, about sport uh, and race and all sorts of issues like that. But before before that, we'd, we'd talk a little bit about the, the last year or 15 months or so. Um, obviously, it's thrown everyone's world upside down. But how, how's it how's it been for you? Have you stayed sane? I know you're a very busy person. You, you work <laughs> very hard. What's What's been kind of the biggest high and low? What's kept yeah. you sane? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, lockdown's been crazy um, for so many of us, right? It, life throws us curveballs. This one is one that we never expected. I think uh, lockdown one, I got really super fit. You know, I think everyone was like on the, the game plan. I was hitting my um, my workouts on the spin bike. I was doing weights. I got in the shape of my life. By lockdown three, you know, it plummeted. Uh, one thing I would say, you can see it in my corner actually over there is my electric drum kit kept me very sane. It's very good for... Um, de-stressing and I also think just in terms of the world and where global events has been it's been a really good time to reflect on so many things in our sport personally um, and has maybe had time actually to just think about things that I want to impact changes I want to see and then actually kind of deciding to do it so it's been a even though it's been frustrating and difficult um, for a lot of us and I think the health concerns are quite scary I also am aware that the reflection time has been pretty powerful for so many people how have the, how have the last 12 months um, w when we look at it through a, the context of the Black Lives Matter movement mm. uh, how, how have they impacted you in that time I know you uh, were active from from sort of day one um, after the death of George Floyd at, in, personally professionally what what's been the impact of that for you and, and what have you yeah. seen yeah it's been massive um you know I, and i spoke in the piece that i did with michael holding which is um on social but i mean george floyd's i would say has been a major impact in my adult life a massive kind of shift in me as an adult really i think the biggest one for so many reasons one it was a recognition, I would say, of a an elephant in the room for society, something that's been there forever, that I've lived, walked, friends of mine from diverse backgrounds, that's white friends, black friends, have seen, have been aware of, and yet still we weren't dealing with it. And then to see something so um, obvious in our face and horrific, uh, it, it was genuinely like a mo I cried straight for two weeks um, on and off 
speaking to friends, I just felt emotional. Um, and I also maybe shifted from being quiet and silent or keeping those issues down to, uh, I don't know, I, I felt like everybody who marched did it, like, we're over this, like it's time that society starts to deal with this, confronts it. I went on three marches and I, I started to become vocal despite feeling fear about speaking. So that piece that I did with Mikey, I mean, I can't tell you how fearful that was to cry on TV. I was worried about the trolls coming out, but equally I just thought, you know, society needs to move. If there was a time to move is when everybody's moving. Um, and I think it's, change the purpose in the work that I do because you know I, we love our sport um it's such a beautiful game in cricket but yet still we know the diversity numbers are low and we'd already I'd already started working on the ace program but I think my purpose in what I do has become more important because now I realize that um I've become I'm now in a privileged position so that's what's really interesting about privilege I would say sometimes you know you can look back and I, in, on, a, on paper I started in a lot of positions of uh not privilege in terms of uh, socioeconomic group, female, black, but now I genuinely am in a position that I can influence. And I realized it, I've got to get on and use my voice. So I think the shift for me has been no longer hiding important issues that I feel it's maybe about being more authentic and two, um, working with other people who feel the same to, to try and make change. And I think I'm seeing signs of that. So a massive shift in using my voice, using my platform. And I feel like there's no going back now because I kind of opened, I've opened up, uh, and started talking a lot. That segment that you did with, with Michael holding, I mean, people have spoken about it being cricket's most important rain delay ever um the, on the first day of last summer uh this very important summer with cricket behind closed doors COVID-19 but then it rained on the very first morning <laughs> and as you, you as you said you were so nervous about opening yourself up like that but do you look back on that and and see it as all worth it as the response being um, mm. Yeah, tell me about the response of being hugely gratifying and, and can you feel the progress that that moment made? Yeah, and, and what's what's crazy about the moment is it's arguably one of the, the biggest fears I had. I mean, I turned off all my social channels. I was expecting to get, you know, I get a, play, a fair few trolls anyway, as we all do in the media. So I was expecting a, a good takedown. And um, I, I thought at best it would be played and um played for one segment and that's it never played again i never imagined that within a you know a day it would have millions of views be going around the world people who are not interested in cricket i've been trying to get interested in cricket uh the videos reaching out and i think the thing that really struck me the most and that maybe what i'm most proud of that we did as a team is one there's a lot of people who don't feel like they can say or speak or have that voice and the, the first kind of major kind of wave of comments I got coming through is I feel that emotion like that's what I feel um and you know to be able to feel like you're helping others have a voice and and speaking their language and connecting with them and knowing that I had a space to do that was powerful the other was realizing that society was more ready than I thought so actually I thought we weren't open to change or ready to change. I think George Floyd's death really shocked so many people across the globe. And also there's a lot of people who maybe were on the fence, not necessarily considerate or act active around the space, but actually it's moved them into a place of power. So I think why the feature connected is the authenticity, but also connecting with voices that hadn't been heard, but also other people ready for change kind of stepped up and connected with it too. So it, it really got a, a nice cross section of, um, of people and you know to win a BAFTA to win I think we've won four awards um is crazy and you know just really proud to have been part of something like that uh in in cricket and in sport barely a week goes past without um stories about the sports relationship with race uh we've seen that in cricket this week with the story about Ollie Robinson and historic tweets we're seeing it in football where the national team's players are being booed for taking the knee um mm. and yet you you sound quite optimistic and you wrote in April, I believe, in the Daily Mail that you've never been more hopeful about the future of diversity in, in, in cricket. What makes you, I know you're a very optimistic person, mm. but what makes <laughs> you say that uh, at this time when 
many would yeah. think that possibly it's, it's going not the opposite. A time for optimism. Um, I'm going to re use a really random analogy, but uh, when the internet came along um, back in the 90s, no one was interested, right? They thought, what is this weird technology? No one gets it. And only, let's say, the early adopters or whatever got on board. There are still people to today, even though the internet has completely revolutionized the world, who still don't believe in the internet. But it's fair to say the internet has changed the game, right? And I think what I'm seeing when it comes to race is that um, we're way past early adopter phase in the sense of, I would say, more people in positions of power when I go into important meetings get it and want to make an impact. I think none more so than Tom Harrison this week making the action he did with Ollie Robinson around, you know, his tweets that's come out and made it a very strong action um, through to people who I'm every day bumping into and want to see society representative for more people. So this is not about getting one group above or below. It's that. So as much as I still see a lot of people, whether it's booing when England took took the knee, whether it's uh, kind of dismissing important issues, I'm still seeing enough waves of change that tells me that progress is being made. I think the awareness is important. Um, I think commitment to, to learning more is there, to making change. I, I don't think we're going to ever solve a problem like racism in society. It's just, you know, it's an, I think it's an impossible task. What I want to see is people in positions of power get it and more everyday people starting to, to understand and be educated. And I am seeing those signs. Um, and so therefore, I'm not going to delete the noise because I think it's important to actually understand why people would boo or understand where people are coming from. It's not about cancel culture. I don't believe in that. Um, and sometimes it's about deeper conversations and connection. But there are definitely enough. And I would say the key to that is people in positions of power. I've seen so much of a shift that, uh, you know, um, even though I would say that it's still a frustrating, exhausting conversation, there's enough to be excited about. You, you mentioned leaders in, in sport uh, and those chief executives and, and people in those kind of positions of power. What would you what concrete action would you like to see from them? Is there enough diversity in those positions to make that? those changes happen yeah i think the first look the first thing i want us to be is a little bit more insight and data driven to making decisions so um you know I'm, I'm, my background is in chemistry and um you know you look at the facts you look at the data so let's start with the big picture in cricket um there are there are now when i first started speaking there were zero black board members on the governing body of ECB and across many sports that has now changed as uh, Lady Baroness Amos has just come through zero black directors of cricket zero you know so you start going through in your case right this is the landscape what would an exciting ambition be that's what I'd ask myself the question I then look at the participation level so you take somewhere like Lambeth as a borough 42 percent of the kids so 10 to 19 year olds are from a black British background so I would then start to get, say, how many are we engaging? Like at the moment it's zero, but where do we want to be? And I think what I'll do is create a bit of a, not just black British community, because I think this is really important that we look at what does our society and makeup look like? It's different in if different communities. You wouldn't expect the same different demographics in Durham as you would in London. Um, it's painting a picture, understanding what the challenges are, and then creating a bit of a plan. And I don't think that I don't think anyone moans if your plan is not ideal, if you're doing something. That's what I've started to realize, even with the ACE program, for example. Uh, you know, sorry, let's be honest. We, we could have been nailed um, a little bit about how much are we doing for the black community. But when these co topics came up, we were actually being active, trying to proactively do something to engage new communities and support pathways through. Once you start getting active, you get clear on what you're trying to achieve then I think the picture becomes more interesting. But I do think we need to look at data and insight. There's so much information from a sport perspective. The dream for me is it for it to be representative of society. At the moment, it's not in our game of cricket. Um, you know, some games are like football in, in terms of participation it is. Um, but then you start to look at leadership and there's another challenge. So it's about painting the picture and the ultimate goal is representative society. It's it's making sure that we have an environment that works for different groups, diverse groups, and then building pathways and support systems through. And the only way you do that is by having 
diverse people in positions of power who are making those decisions, deciding the key outcomes and driving that action. So you need people around who can really work through, um, you know, what you're trying to achieve. In so many ways, you've been a, a trailblazer in, in cricket and particularly in women's cricket, both as a player and, and in your retirement as well. When, when did you first become aware that were that there were institutional problems in the game? Was it <laughs> when you became the first black woman to play for England or was it were you much younger than than that when you realised these things? I think cricket's a unique game um, in terms of being, a, being the first black woman to play cricket for England and 99% mm, of the time walking into most rooms within our game and you've, you've been either the only woman, it's often the only working class or the only person of colour. Um, I think I knew pretty quickly, uh, I would say maybe about 10, 11. So I'd love to tell you that it's something that dawned on me later. Um, I, I love the game and I think that's what I, I chased uh, was was the joy of the game. Um, but I, I was quite aware and I was, you know, I think because of coming from London, which is so, so multicultural and so, um, you know, everybody on my road, my school, jobs that I had was, you know, different sorts of people. Then it was quite noticeable going into other worlds, um, which were much more exclusive. So, um I think I knew early on, and I suppose, I don't know, I don't even know what the next part to that is really. It's just knowing that, yeah, I knew quite early on. <laughs> <laughs> when when did you decide to launch the ACE programme? And, and can you tell me a bit about its progress progress in its short history? Yeah, so, so just for some people, the ACE programme stands for the African Caribbean Engagement Programme. Um, I decided we launched it just over a year ago, January 2020, and it, it came up because Jofra Archer, as you know, is an England cricketer that we both admire hugely, I'd assume, um, was just at the helm. And he, I remember watching him charge in against Steve Smith and thinking, what a role model. And he could be around for 10 years. And I know how important it is to see representation, see something that looks like you. And I also knew there was a 75% decline in professional black players and the participation was dying. So I knew those two stats, but I always felt we were missing a piece without um, someone inspirational at the top. So I remember seeing him charging in that summer thinking, wow, this could be game changer. And then I had a conversation with the chief executive at Surrey, Richard Gould, about my feelings. I just sort of said, look, how is it possible that, you know, we're in the heart of the Black British community, actually? And, you know, you look at London's demographics, it's, you know, up to 19%, um, which is, is pretty high. So how are we not seeing more come through our sport? And what's great about someone like him, um, you know, and this is why I know change is possible and is happening is because he's a massive advocate it was like, let's just get on and get things moving. And he, he, he asked me to unpick my journey of what helped me get in the sport, what things were vital to me being able to kick on. And we realized the academy environment was vital, mentoring, support, opportunity, um, providing all the access that you need. And he just said, let's create it and go. We didn't know if we'd find any kids um, who were interested in the game. And what was fascinating to us is that um so much talent we had 100 kids turn up to the, the 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 kind of open day just come and show his interest and the talent level was ridiculous so all of a sudden we're eyeing up a load of kids going hold on these could be players for the future how have we not engaged and i suppose what it told us is the game the relationship was severed because there was a community out there playing actually opening with welcoming arms meant that they felt part of our game and welcoming them to a big club and also saying this club is for you as well relationships can be rebuilt there's a wealth of talent that's possibly going to football rugby athletics right now that if you're super competitive like i am i'm going right let's get some talent through the door um, and sport england loved what we were doing they'd released a report earlier in the year called sport for all which kind of indicated that a lot of sports similar to ours um, were actually struggling for diversity and despite sort of trends in society of becoming more diverse actually some of the sports were going the other way so i think they saw ace as a way of um supporting talent because you know it's a talent id program 
finding talent from the community and, and providing an alternative way through. So we're really fortunate they gave us half a million and we're now in London, Birmingham and about to go to Bristol. So exciting times ahead. As, as London rebuilds after the pandemic and, and sports venues open up again as they are now, is, is this a, do, you, do you see this as a moment to kind of rethink access and the opportunities in sport? Is there anything you'd like to see happen mm. particularly at grass loop, yeah. grassroots level? I don't get me banging on my drum here. Um, <laughs> two things. Oh, well, the most important thing that came out during um, this whole period is just the inequalities um, throughout the whole pandemic uh, and that affected physical health, mental health, education, um, you know, the lower socioeconomic groups and the more diverse groups were, were just massively at disadvantage. So um, what it said to me is more investment needs to just go into those areas. And actually the, the, the thing that can be used as a benefit off the back of the pandemic is I think more people realize how important health is. So, you know, using that narrative to say, let's keep getting active, let's look after ourselves is important. What I would like to see actually, and this is something that's become clear more as we do ACE program is that the facilities are harder for uh, people in inner cities, as we've always known. But I, I, I think there's ways of getting more creative around how we create things. Cricket, for example, it's very hard to have proper cricket clubs in inner cities. But a lot of the work we're doing is around much more creative activation around things like non-turf pitches, which are like astroturf strips. Um, you know, we're looking at talking to some other sports. Could we come together with two or three sports similar to ours, which struggle to access inner cities and create programs that could be can work together? So what I would say is that I have no doubt since the pandemic that the groups that we need to help the most have the least access and have the least opportunity. And so I think it's about investing. And then the other thing I'll say is being innovative and creative about the programs that we create that really um, engage different audiences that need to be engaged. Cricket's got uh, a series of st statistics about private school uh, participants. Uh, I think the, the men's uh, England team, 43% of current players go to went to private school. Uh, it's not too far behind in the women's game. Um, is access to the sport as much a, a class or social issue as, mm. as a race issue in, in your eyes? And can, yeah. can we learn lessons from other sports? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stats. I've been working with a guy called Tom Brown from the Birmingham City University, just going through the data just to help us build our programme. And the stat that kind of really upsets me, to be fair, is um, you look at white state school kids and white private school kids. If they're both in our performance structure, so they're both already, say, playing junior count, they're already in the structure. A white private school kid is 13 times more likely to end up getting a contract and becoming a professional cricketer. Um, once that, so they already both got talent, they're already in the system. And it, there's nothing wrong with private school systems because actually I think the private schools have done a great job in producing talent. Um, you know, it's not against the private schools. What I would say is 93% of the population do not go to private schools. So we need to make sure that we're doing enough or more to get kids from you know lower socioeconomic groups diverse groups in um when i look at the numbers and the stats you know we started going through it and i think there's there's two areas there's a socioeconomic factor that gets you into the game and then i think then you can add a layer on in terms of diversity so if you're from a british asian or black british background then it, it adds other dimensions but I think the key is, you know, breaking down access to sport. There's nothing, you know, and actually I would say, and I'd argue in a, in a really positive way, the answer is, and the solution is working with private schools to actually help that. We, with ACE, for example, have um, started to partner with a couple of schools that are gonna support us with facilities, um, with match play, um, with a lot of ways of creatively coming together as a community to, to tackle the problem. So I think it's important, you know, people realise this is not a, a tar on private schools. I think private schools have done a great job, but we need to make sure that there are pathways, systems that support the 93% of population. And, you know, to do that, we have to really invest. It's, you know, it's, let's be honest, it's going to take some money, it's going to take assets, it's going to take uh, creativity with different groups working together. So, you know, we know we'll partner with groups like Chance to Shine, who are charities doing national work, as well as county boards, as well as private schools, 
it's going to take everybody having to come together to solve this problem. But what is clear to me is, you know, when you start to go into the data and the insight that our sport is skewed and, you know, that's not, to me, that's not acceptable. It's got to be a sport that represents society. And so we've got to come together collectively to solve these problems. We've all seen on, on social media sports, men and women being told to stick to cricket or stick mm -hmm. to football or, or, or whatever. But now we're, we're entering a new era, it feels, where you've got the likes of uh, Marcus Rashford or Mara Toji speaking out. Uh, presumably you're hugely encouraged by this and think this can make a huge difference. Yeah, look, I, God, I think as an athlete 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I played, I genuinely thought, you know, sport is here, everything's compartmentalised. Uh, almost get into robot mode and try and deliver and score some runs and get on with it. Um, but what is clear, and especially with the younger generation and the millennial generation coming through, they care about a lot. You know, that generation care about climate change. They care about racial inequality. They care about a range of issues that um, I think it's hard to ask athletes to just like box it up and not care. And, you know, if you're a coach, you know, you're telling a player basically to cut a part of themselves off and not care. So the younger generation are much more switched on. I'm talking, I'm, I'm trying to grab onto the cusp of the millennials. I'm not quite, um, neither you most probably will. I don't know where you class yourself. Um, but I would say that the younger generation care. And so therefore I'm not surprised that we're seeing more athletes. It's not the others didn't care. I just don't think the world allowed for that space to happen and the shift with social media the shift with um society really has meant that that younger athletes are speaking up look naomi osaka all, all you know all sorts of um younger people are talking about things like mental health so i think credit to the athlete I, what's obvious is it adds more pressure to your performance because you're now going to be not only um, you know, commented on and, and dealt with from a perspective of performance. Now it's the rounded picture and that adds more pressure. But equally, the other point is athletes, I think, want to be more authentic. And um, I, I really respect that. It's something that I look back on and wish if I was able to have done. So so I really respect that athletes now in, in their prime and in their, like, at the top of their game are doing this. And the impact that they have is game changing, absolutely game changing because the media pay attention, kids pay attention, parents pay attention. And I think more athletes know that they do have an amazing platform to use. Ebony, thank you so much for chatting to us. We could talk all day, I think, but uh, we have to stop there. Thank you once more and just keep up the good work and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me, Will. Really good fun.